Good afternoon. On behalf of Berkeley Symphony, I welcome you to the premiere of Real Berkeley, our brand new series celebrating the radical, edgy, audacious, and loving scenes that define our unique Berkeley community. My name is Renee Mandel, Artistic Director for Berkeley Symphony. Today, we present to you Rad Women, a journey through the hearts and souls of three radical composers, Gabriella Smith, Clara Schumann, and Rena Esmail, whose works will be performed by our brilliant Berkeley Symphony musicians. We are deeply honored to have the imitable Kate Schatz with us today, who throughout this episode will share her soulful insight and perspective on each of our three rad women and their lives. And now, it is with great pleasure that I introduce to you Kate Schatz. Snake skins, turtle shells, honeycombs, raspberries, crystals, quilts, motherhood, my son's nightmares. These are tessellations, shapes repeated over and over again, fitting together without gaps or overlaps, covering a plane, infinite, ongoing, again and again. Fissures in the rocks, cracks in the mud, lines on my face, fish scales, endless lockdown, womanhood, Moorish mosaic, origami, pineapple quarantine, the endless virtual worlds my son builds in Minecraft, an infinite geometry that he can control. He creates, he destroys, he rebuilds, he dies, he respawns. What patterns are we part of and which ones can we control? Sunrise, sunset, the steady heartbeat pushing us through each day. In this season of sorrow, what gives you the feeling of hope. Gabriella Smith seeks to connect listeners with the natural world. She grapples with the grief, loss, rage, fear, and hopelessness that she feels in the cruel face of climate change. But she's rooted and exuberant in the joy, beauty, and wonder that she can feel in the world's last wild places. She goes into the woods, under the sea. There's control in composition, the execution of a grand vision, delegating parts in service of a realized whole, co-creating a community of sound, orchestrating movement and joy. You do this, now you do that, and together, here's what we'll be. How do we manage to compose our days? Conceiving and birthing, arranging and raising, Cleaning, crying, laughing, making, then lying down to rest before doing it all over and over again. Celebration and creation, destruction and chaos, the way women hold it together, hold it up to the light, the power and control of composition, the unseen labor behind the scenes. I think of how we've shown up for each other again and again as each system has failed us. There's a heartbeat running through this piece, racing but steady. Sounds call, respond, cry out, relentless, like how I have felt for one year now, homebound with two young children, cut off from our worlds and wild with uncertainty, isolation, the days a frustrating blur of snacks and disarray. But like Smith's music, the chaos gets cut through with hope. Light comes through the cracks. In this unraveling, there is awe and potential. I read yet another article about what this pandemic is doing to women, to working women, to mothers, to working women who are mothers. The labor is never ending, ashes to ashes, dust ball to dust ball, a spiral of time, love, stress, sleep. This past year, we've cultivated new kinds of attention, knowing each bird that comes to the feeder, the shorebirds we see on the water, the loud crows on the line. We've named the backyard possums, watched just hatched baby ducks, tracking time by the blossoms of the apple tree around the corner. I read about the women finding new selves, breaking out of old skin. I read about them and also I am one, transforming and shedding, liberated and ready. The composer in the woods, the wild woman in the kitchen, the loss and the fear, the joy and the wonder. That pattern is a recipe, 
That recipe is a symphony. That symphony is a life. That's why we create over and over again.
A woman must not desire to compose. There has never yet been one able to do it. Should I expect to be the one? Clara Schumann expressed this when she was 20 years old. And I don't doubt that this question tessellated within her for all those years, perhaps sometimes quiet and on some days a crescendo. It can be so loud, the self-doubt. Even 19th century musical prodigies suffered from imposter syndrome. How effectively it can quash desire. But the need to create can be louder. In women like Clara, the art won, at least for a while. She composed this, her one and only piano trio, during her stay in Dresden, the narratives tell us, evoking a bucolic vacation or a leisurely time. It was 1845 and she was there with her husband, Robert, who would, of course, become far more famous than she, in the hopes that the climate and sanative mineral waters might help heal him. His diagnosis, nervous stress, they said, and I cannot read that without a slight pang in my heart and gut. During their several years stay in Dresden, Clara cared for her suicidal husband. She gave birth to their first four children, one of whom died, and she suffered at least one miscarriage. She managed the household. She gave private piano lessons. She paid all the bills and she composed this one last work. Robert, bless his anxious heart, was sympathetic to her plight. He wrote of her musical and tender ingenuity, and he noted the age-old quandary, writing, but to have children and a husband who is always living in the realm of imagination does not go together with composing. She cannot work at it regularly, and I am often disturbed to think how many profound ideas are lost because she cannot work them out. Indeed. Clara, bless her hardest working woman in show business heart, once wrote that there is nothing that surpasses the joy of creation, if only because through it one wins hours of self-forgetfulness when one lives in a world of sound. Clara, where did you find those hours in that Dresden home with your babies, your sick husband in his realm, with the dishes and the diapers and the revolutionary rumbles outside the home? Did you disappear entirely into that world of sound? Or did the ghosts of those you've lost sit with you while you wrote to forget? Clara wrote this piece between 1845 and 1846. In 1849, she was seven months pregnant when the uprising erupted, she knew Robert would be conscripted. So she took him and their seven-year-old daughter away in the night through dark fields to a train and she rode with them to safety. Then she returned home alone to save her three younger children who she'd left with a maid. She ran back through those fields patrolled by armed men. She saved her children, she saved them all. She had three more children, she stopped composing. Robert was institutionalized. He died by suicide. Clara supported her family by teaching and performing piano concerts around Europe. I think about what it must have felt like then to travel the continent and give those concerts, her children home with a cook and a maid, for her to be on a stage lost briefly in the realm of her very own self. What an honor now to experience her world of sound.
An artist doesn't create entirely outside of her circumstances. We create in reaction and relation to our communities, our surroundings. This pandemic, the loss and suffering and chaos, the crises of our country, of our climate, racial reckonings and systemic brutality. Our poems will reflect the rage and the grief, our requiems too relevant. I imagine the landscapes will paint charred California hills, skies dark orange, our portraits wearing masks, even our wine will taste of last year's smoke. The stories of this time, deeply human, deeply complex, and multifaceted. There's never one story, instead a multiplicity of narratives, a chorus, not a solo. Hi, I'm Rena Esmail, and I'm the composer of Mediseki Kiavaz, My Sister's Voice. This piece begins with a theme that you probably all have heard. It's the flower duet from Delib's opera Lachme. And in this opera, it's kind of a French exoticized version of two Indian women sitting by a river singing uh, to one another. And 
I heard this piece and thought to myself, gosh, what would it sound like if there were actually two Indian women sitting by a river in India singing to one another? And that started as the beginning inspiration for this piece. And what you'll hear is an Indian classical singer and a Western opera singer interacting with one another in many ways throughout the three movements of this piece. And, you know, they come from very different cultures. They come from very different musical trainings. But what I love is that they're able to meet one another in dialogue. And they don't necessarily have to have the same musical system. They don't need to necessarily even speak the same language. But they're able to complement each other and make each other's lives richer through this journey as sisters with one another. This performance with Berkeley Symphony is so special to me because both of these women are of Indian heritage. You have Saili Oak, who's an Indian classical vocalist. You know, she was born in Mumbai and she moved to the Bay Area and lives here now and sings Hindustani vocal music. And then you have Maya Kirani, who is a soprano, a Western trained soprano, who was, has grown up in the United States and then is also living in the Bay Area. And it's amazing just to see that these two women have come from really kind of maybe similar heritages and that they're, they're both South Asian, but you can see just the breadth of experience of what they're both able to do, both separately and then when they come together. I'm so glad to be presenting this work in the Bay Area because it represents such a broad range of what Indian culture is. So I would say that one of the best Indian classical music scenes in the United States is right here in the Bay Area. But we also have so many other South Asians who have gone into other careers. You know, people who are doing tech startups, people who are in medicine, you know, people who are, are in business. And I really think that at the very top levels of those careers, it requires just as much creativity as we have to have as musicians. And so I think that's what this piece is about to me. It's about bringing different strands into dialogue with one another so that we can complement each other and that we can build this really rich tapestry where we all have a place. And now here is my sister's voice, Merisaki Kiawaz.
And there we have it. The beauty, the chaos, the sound, and the fury. Thank you so much to these composers for creating radical, necessary works and for letting us into your worlds of sound. May we all continue to create and to reflect and to shape this world. I'm Kate Schatz, and thank you to the Berkeley Symphony. It's been an honor to be part of this program. Thank you very much, Kate Schatz, for sharing your profound words and thoughts with us today. And a very special thank you to the exquisite Rena Esmail, Siley Oak, Maya Karani, our musicians and our filmmakers for all the creative artistry that you bring to our world. And finally, on behalf of all of us here at Berkeley Symphony, thank you for tuning in. See you next time. Oh,